ready to get started with the next presentation. Hello again. Uh, because Dr. Smith is away learning how to use the Instrad to break things more successfully, uh, I have the privilege of introduce, introducing uh, Dash Ruthenberg, uh, who is going to present the, uh, the ASME, USI ASME student chapter competition of the human powered vehicle. Um, this, he also wins the award for the, uh, the most amount of stuff he's brought to senior presentations. But, um, but this, this bicycle, um, human powered vehicle, uh, actually competed. Uh, earlier um, this month, earlier this month, and uh, and he will tell you the story of that. So, Dash, thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Phil. Give me just a moment here. To load this up. So the objective of the project was to redesign and build the fairing to compete in the American Society of Mechanical Engineers Human Powered Vehicle Competition in Orlando, Florida. The competition attracts universities from all over the country who come and compete in design, innovation, endurance, and high-speed events. So the vehicle you see here is a second generation vehicle. Um, last year, Zach Adams, Brett Bielfeld, and the rest of the human powered vehicle team designed and built the first generation USI human powered vehicle, which you see here. I was fortunate enough to uh, have participated on that team, and I learned some very valuable lessons that I could apply to this year's project. So, what we have here is a manual plug hole. Um, last year, to build that plug, we started with the CAD model, and from that CAD model, we built the plywood skeleton that you see in the top of the we filled the skeleton in with foam, and then we cut the foam with a hot wire um, that we borrowed from the concrete canoe team. Thanks, guys. And um, the process worked all right, but the hot wire doesn't give a very good finish. And then the plywood and the foam sand unevenly. So it was it's tough to get a good finish using that process. Um, then on top of that plug, we laid plug up with fiberglass to create the fiberglass ferrum part. And in that top picture, you see Lucas cutting into the ferrum to release it from the plug mold. Um, so a major lesson learned there is that we needed to uh, design a release mechanism that would function properly. Now in the bottom photo, you see the damaged plug. Uh, partly that was damaged by uh, what you see Lucas doing in the top photo, but it was also damaged from um, the very high vacuum pressures that it saw uh, when we tried to vacuum mold it. So we learned that we needed to design a mold that would withstand high vacuum pressures. So the goals for the 2014 fairing were to produce a quality build, fit, and finish. We wanted a lighter weight fairing than last year's, and we wanted, the, we wanted the vehicle to be fully functional to compete in the competition. In this slide, uh, I'll give you an overview of the composite manufacturing process for the HPV fairing. We uh, started with a SolidWorks CAD model. 
And from that model, I made a male plug out of foam, which you see here. Um, I laid the male plug up with fiberglass to create this female mold. And then I, the female mold was used to vacuum infuse the carbon fiber and the carbon fiber fiberglass hybrid part. And there you see the carbon fiber, <coughs> fiberglass hybrid top half of the fairing. So we'll start with the SolidWorks CAD model. Um, the CAD model was designed, the fairing was designed to fit on top of a minimally modified version of the 2013 HPD frame. Um, so just getting that design in SolidWorks was half the battle. One of the major problems we encountered then was how do, how, how do I construct this complex shape, right? So ideally, I would like to hand the SolidWorks CAD file over to a machinist and say, here, put this on your CNC mill and cut these molds for us. Um, the problem there is a uh, CNC mill large enough to cut this part is both rare and very costly. So um, the estimate I received well, to cut, cut both molds was $30,000. That was prohibited, so we moved on to plan B. Plan B involved sectioning this fairing model into 149 three quarter inch thick planes. So here you see an example of one of those three quarter inch planes. Um, those plans were then mirrored onto a mirror plane, no, a mirror plane, I call it. And uh, they were arranged in an AutoCAD file and they were cut out of foam using the Applied Engineering Center's new water jet machine. And then those <coughs> profiles were then laminated together to create this male plug you see here. So I'll, we'll step through the process here. There's another photo of the SOLIDWORKS model. Here you see the Applied Engineering Center, Center's new war jet, water jet machine in action. Um, in the background, there are, it's tough to see on the screen, but those are stacks of cut profiles. So we'll get a glimpse of uh, what this machine actually does. So I, um, in the model, I gave each profile a unique number so that um, when they were all cut, I didn't have any issues with arranging them in order. Um, that turned out to be a good idea, although it did leave a bunch of little scraps in the water jet machine. What you see there, that square is a two by four alignment pin. So these profiles all fit on a two by four, and that's how they, they line up down that pin. There you're getting a glimpse of, this is a pretty large machine. The, um, the sheets are four foot by eight foot sheets of extruded polystyrene foam that you find in um, any home improvement store. So here's kind of the last final cut of the profile. Gives you an idea of how this process worked. So all in all, I cut um, 26, I used 26 for about four foot by eight foot sheets to cut 149 three quarter inch thick profiles. So there you see a finished sheet after it's been cut. Um, proceeding with the project like this and, and um, you know, having access to the modeling software, I was able to optimize on material and reduce waste by being able to arrange those profiles uh, before I started cutting. So here you see the profiles being aligned on the pin. Um, the 
next step was to apply adhesive. I used diluted liquid nails. I applied the diluted liquid nails with a paintbrush. That seemed to be much more effective than using a caulk gun on each of those profiles. The profiles were then clamped together. Um, you can see the bar clamps here. Uh, one lesson I learned is it, uh, it pays off to you know, invest some time in the craftsmanship here. It saves, saves having to do some fixes later on. I got some of the cramp, clamps crooked and uh, that complicated the process somewhat. So here I put together the top and bottom halves of the plug. Uh, the reason I did this is I wanted to ensure that they would fit together properly, so I sanded those edges so that they, there was a perfect fit. Next, I sealed the polystyrene with a special product called Duratec StyroShield. It's designed to be compatible with both the polystyrene foam and the resins involved in the layup process. Um, pay attention there to the plexiglass line that runs along the length of the plug. We'll get to that here momentarily. So once that plug was sealed up, um, it was ready to be laid up with fiberglass to create the female mold that you see on the far left. Um, this is the bottom half. On stage here is the top half. Um, like I said earlier, the lesson we learned from last year is that these molds needed to withstand extreme vacuum pressures. So the plywood skeleton you see applied there on top of the fiberglass. Um, I built these rib supports or skeletons so that that mold would withstand the extreme vacuum pressures involved in the infusion process. So since I already had all those profiles programmed into, those, into the water jet, these plywood profiles were easy to put together. Um, they were simply, it was simply laid over the top of the fiberglass layup on the plug and then tabbed in to the plywood. And at this point, I let that cure for about 48 hours and kept my fingers crossed because I knew the next step would be trying to release this thing off, off the base. Um, and that's what we had trouble with last year. So I got a pry bar out and I started prying on this thing for about half an hour until I heard a snap, crack, and pop. And I thought, oh, great, it just popped, no problems. Lo and behold, it popped with the foam plug in it. So I was thinking, oh no, what happens next? So uh, fortunately, um, in one of the purchases, we picked up some of these plastic wedges that are designed, they're, they're uh, used for releasing molds like this, and they work very well. And that um, bottom plug that stuck in the mold came out in three pieces, but it did come out without any problems. Here you see the tail piece of the bottom plug. So this is a shot of the bottom half of the female mold right after the plug had been released. And there is a shot of the two parts of the top half of the mold after they have been released. So I'm, I'm hoping some of you might be wondering, so why is the top half made out of two parts? Well, the top half needed to be made in two parts that could bolt together and unbolt to um, accommodate the negative drag in the top half of the bearing. So here I'll attempt to explain to you what uh, negative draft is. So let's pretend the photo on the left is the bottom half of the bearing, which does not have a negative draft. The yellow lines are the fiberglass that are laid up on top of that foam plug to create the mold. So on the left, you see the fiberglass is laid over the top of that plug. And when it cures and you release it, you pull straight up on the top and it lifts straight off. Um, on the contrary, the picture on the right is an exaggerated version of what the top half of the mold looks like. 
and this is supposed to be illustrating the negative drag. So when you um, lay up fiberglass on top of this plug, this negative draft, there's no way that it will pull straight off when you try and lift off because it's curved in. Uh, it's a very slight negative draft. It's hard to see. Um, if, you, if you look closely, you might be able to see it, but uh, it's just enough that there's no way that that uh, top half of the mold would come off. So um, this year, instead of cutting it off like we did last year, we made the top half molds in two pieces. So that, that mold would just unbolt. And um, I don't know, you might notice quarter inch holes here where it was bolted along the flange. So that mold just came, came apart in two halves and worked out pretty well. So now that we had the female molds, um, they were finished and waxed, and the female molds were now ready for the vacuum infusion process. So this photo shows the first step. That's the black is carbon fiber mat, and the yellow is breather cloth. And then a black line that's duct tape running down the bottom of the part is the resin channel. Um, this white tacky tape along the edge of the flange um, is double-sided tape, so it creates a seal between the flange on the mold and the vacuum bag. The pink, pinkish bag you see here is the vacuum bag, and this is the part being infused. Um, here we have resin coming in from being sucked in by vacuum pressure through the resin port, and then this dark, this dark um, area here is the resin actually infusing up into the part. So here we have two vacuum ports connected via this plastic tubing to the vacuum pump here in the background. Um, there is a resin trap so the resin doesn't get sucked into the pump. Um, so the vacuum pressure that's sucking through these ports <coughs> pulls the resin up through this five gallon bucket in through the port and up through the part. So this is uh, the process after about 15 minutes the resin can travel that far. This is the resin here in the bottom. Um, so what are the advantages to a vacuum infusion over a hand layout say? When a hand layout um, it's common to get air bubbles and also, you can't control the amount of resin that goes into that part. So if you get extra resin in the part, that's going to make the part heavier. With this vacuum bag, the, the, the vacuum pressure sucks the bag and presses all the material into the wall of the mold. So you're going to get the finish that your mold has. If you have a perfect mold, you're going to get more or less a perfect finish. And that bag also sucks out any excess resin, giving you a lighter weight. So here's a rough shot of the bottom half of the ferry. So this is the bottom half that's on the bike now. Um, this is right after the release. Looks a little rough, but it, uh, that's just the flange. So that was going to be flange on the exterior. It was going to be trimmed off anyhow. Um, the part itself was, was very nice, light, and stiff. So we we're impressed with that part. Here we have the top half being released. Um, so on the top half, we used a carbon fiber and a fiberglass hybrid because we run short on carbon fiber material. Um, the top half came out with a great finish. Um, it was significantly heavier because more layers of fiberglass were used to uh, achieve the same level of stiffness and strength that we received from just using the carbon fiber on the bottom half. So, um, you know, that was, uh, I was feeling like I was home free after that uh, because those parts came out well. Now I just needed to put, fit them on the bike, uh, cut out the windshield, and cut out the top, the top hatch. Um, 
and I painted it, finished it, um, and here's Cameron Reed inside the vehicle competing in Orlando. Um, the team did very well. We placed 13th overall out of about 34 teams. We were excited for Cameron, who's riding here. She finished ninth. Uh, she qualified for the women's speed event and finished ninth. So uh, as far as budgeting and balance sheets go here, we received $2,400 from Endeavor, and you can see where that money went. Um, it's important to note that we've had significant um, donation of materials from Seth Carlin, who provided um, all, this, all the carbon fiber and resin and vacuum bagging materials, and um, that was a big help. Um, just, just the resin and fabric alone would have run about $1,500. And that excludes a lot of miscellaneous materials like tacky tape and vacuum bag, forts, the vacuum pump, all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm happy to report that uh, the project was in funded entirely by grant money, so um, I, don't, I don't think it cost the department anything. Um, and you know, a lot of the expense for a project like this is in the travel, so the travel actually costs you know, more it costs more to travel down there than it does to build the actual bike. And uh, we had all the travel funded by grant money as well. So in conclusion here, um, I wasn't super impressed with the finish of the bike. You can see it's a little rough. Um, I was really hoping for a class A finish, but uh, you know, it turned out all right. The bike was stiffer, but it was heavier than last year's. So, I failed in that category. Um, the weights are listed here. The one important thing to notice on the weights is that the bottom half of this year's fairing was lighter than the bottom half of last year's fairing. And of course, the bottom half of this year's fairing was the one made entirely of carbon fiber. So um, that indicates to me that if the entire fairing had been built from carbon fiber, it would have come in lighter than last year's. Um, the ride of the, of the human-powered vehicle was definitely improved, and I think that shows in our, our rankings or where we placed in the competition. Um, it, it, it rode a lot better. Um, the project was an excellent experience in project management, uh, so I really I, I learned a lot there. But ultimately, um, ultimately, the ultimate takeaway from this was I, I truly gained an appreciation for good design work that I didn't have before doing this project. So that was great. Uh, it was a lot of work and a lot of fun. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible without a lot of you folks out there. So thanks to Endeavor, um, SGA Travel Award, the Provost Travel Award, Seth Carlin, who helped a ton, Brad Laney out at Central High School, who there they just got back from Shell Eco Marathon in Houston, Texas. I uh, haven't heard about their results yet, but uh, looking forward to talking to those folks. Uh, we worked with the Central High School High Mileage Vehicle um, as kind of a strategic partnership. Um, I'd like to thank the HPV team. This project was only a small component of the overall HPV project. Lucas Borman, Dora Hover, Tyson Miller, Cameron Reed, uh, did a ton of work all on writing grants, fixing up the frame, um, design reports, etc. Donna Moore, thank you very much for all your help. Uh, we got to know each other a lot better this semester because I was in there bugging you an awful lot. Uh, Justin Amos, Kevin Nelson, Vince Frazier, uh, you guys were awesome over at the AEC and helped out a ton. You guys made our lives easier over there. We really appreciate it. Um, of course, a really a, a big thanks goes out to my advisor and the HPV advisor, Dr. Smith, who couldn't be here this morning. Um, her countless hours um, put into this project made this project happen. And I'd like to thank her for all of her tutelage and support in this project. And of course, the engineering faculty in general, Dr. Mitchell, Dr. Field, Dr. Davis, Professor Nelson for sitting through dry runs, providing critiques. Um, everybody else out there, this is certainly uh, 
Um, you know, it takes the whole faculty to get a project like this done. Um, and yeah, I'll uh, I'll end it there. Any questions? All right, questions. Dash, so um, very nicely done uh, to, to you and the whole, whole team. Um, but as far as uh, what's what what your legacy is going to be, um, can we can we use these molds again for next year's team uh, and just redesign the frame? Can we redesign just the bottom part if we want to want to make it more spacious? What what uh, how does this how does this move forward? Yeah, so the possibilities are endless on uh, moving forward here. I, I think more than anything we need some. Uh, some students to step up and take this project on. Um, well, yeah, but as far as the mold goes, what what uh, what? Do yeah, you the see? molds are perfectly. I mean, the molds are here. They're they're uh, available for folks to use. Um, there is an issue on what we're going to do about storing the molds, uh, so we'll have to talk about that. Um, but yeah, I'd recommend a uh, I'd recommend a complete redesign and rebuild of this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been great. Can certainly run with this or. But I'd like to see a team continue with a, you know, a pure carbon fiber monocoque tub-based trike design. Um, think, so that would be a, um, you know, a, a vehicle where the structural members were made entirely out of carbon fiber, basically molded. You know, you start with maybe a fairing and then build the structure in with carbon fiber. And of course, a trike because we've learned that a bicycle with a full fairing is not a wise idea. You can see scratch marks there. Uh, that was pretty gnarly crash that uh, Cameron went down in. Anything else? I know we're uh, got to get things moving here. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so now, if I could just enlist some volunteer support to get these things out of here, that'd be great. Thanks.